Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to a location just a few hundred miles south of our prior episode on Christine Courtney, about 55 miles west of Calgary, Alberta, Canada, to a frequently traveled trail near Canmore. This area is lush pine and fir forests rimmed with giant granite mountain peaks. The mountains in this area run north and south and form a high elevation barrier that draws precipitation to it. The mountaintops are cold enough to cause the clouds to condense enough to release their moisture in the form of rain and snow, which benefits the forest and animals alike. The common animals you will see here are moose, elk, deer, caribou, sheep, and mountain goats. The predators of the area include coyotes, wolves, cougars, as well as black and brown bears. It is in this picturesque and scenic setting that our episode takes place today. Canmore is a small resort-like town with only 13,000 inhabitants that has a nice golf course called Silvertip with a nice jogging trail around it. It seems like lately there have been a lot of brown bears interacting with people here, and some of those interactions are not very settling. There was a smallish male brown bear who had been frequenting and even stalking people while they were outdoors with their pets or just out for a walk. On a sunny afternoon in early May of 2005, Nikki Davison took her basset hound out for a walk and was planning on taking pictures of some wild flowers near Silvertip Golf Course. Silvertip is named after the hair color grizzlies are known for that makes them appear grizzled. While she had her photo shoot set up, a loud crash came from the trees just above where her and her dog were. They had unwittingly drawn the attention of the previously mentioned young brown bear. As the bear crept down onto the hiking trail, Nikki's mind was filled with terrifying thoughts of nightmares realized. The bear slowly and methodically walked toward Nikki and her dog as she quickly picked up her equipment. Nikki led her dog in a slow retreat from the bear for ten minutes along the golf course trail. This brown bear was stalking Nikki and her dog. Its head was low and it stared at them as it slowly approached them. She managed to escape the hair-raising encounter and immediately reported the incident to wildlife officials. Wildlife officials showed up and tranquilized the young brown bear. They next affixed a radio tracking collar and relocated the bear to an area inside of nearby Banff National Park, hoping that he would find a niche for himself among local bear populations and forget his fascination with human civilization. For the next week, the bear researchers had watched him as his monitor indicated he was making his way back toward the golf course and what he must have considered his home. He seemed to hang out for a few days in the hills just above town before making his way back to the Silver Tip Golf Course area and the site of the tragedy of our topic today. A female hiker was enjoying her time on the trail on June 5, 2005. She was near the first hole of the Silver Tip Golf Course when she was confronted by the same young bear who was relocated. He exhibited the same stalking behaviors and she began to yell in an attempt to frighten him. Her screams alerted a groundskeeper on the golf course. He drove the golf course pickup truck over to the hiker and picked her and her dog up and drove them to safety. Next he flipped on the golf course irrigation system and doused the bear to encourage him to leave. A little understanding of recent policies is in order. There is an international policy called the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, which works to codify into environmental policies protected travel corridors, which are supposed to allow wildlife to travel between habitats. The idea behind this is that as wildlife becomes stressed, they might relieve that stress by utilizing a wildlife travel corridor to access a different habitat in which the demands on them may differ. Canmore is just one of many U.S. and Canadian towns located in the middle of the Yellowstone to Yukon Corridor. This policy is in conflict with allowing burgeoning towns the development that they are inevitably experiencing. The trail near the Silvertip Golf Course had been closed since April to allow wildlife like cougars and bears to cross into adjacent habitats free of human interference. After frightening the hiker, the young brown bear dashed off into the nearby forest only to return once things calmed down. Along this same portion of the trail, a small group of friends were jogging. In that group was 36-year-old competitive mountain biker Isabel Dube. She was the mother of a five-year-old daughter and an avid fitness practitioner. 
She worked as a substitute French language teacher after relocating to Canmore from a small town near Quebec City. Isabel and two of her female jogging partners rounded a bend in the trail, coming face to face with one of their darkest fears. There was the young brown bear standing and facing them in the trail, a mere twenty meters ahead of them. The bear was staring directly at them, with its head low and ears pinned back. As it stared at them, it slowly lumbered toward them with an eerie quietness. It was apparent this bear was interested in approaching the women with clear intentions. The group of joggers slowly backed up as one. They gave ground to the young brown bear as it closed in on them slowly. The women fought the urge to break and run away, knowing this may cause a predatory response from the bear. They made noise, yelled, and slowly gave ground for a considerable distance before realizing this bear was intent on eating them. Isabel decided she would seek the protection of a tree, so as the ladies gave ground, she started climbing up into its boughs, hoping that the bear wouldn't be able to climb it. The problem is that most brown bears are too big to climb trees very well, but smaller ones can climb trees as well as black bears. As Isabel grabbed limbs and pulled herself up, higher and higher into the tree, her jogging partners continued to back down the trail and around the bend. As soon as the joggers lost sight of the bear, they broke and ran the one-quarter mile distance to find an attendee at the Silver Tip Golf Course. The last they saw of Isabel was that she was climbing into the tree and the bear was focused on her as she did so. They knew they had only a limited amount of time and had to hope for the best for Isabel as they got help. It doesn't take joggers much time to sprint a quarter mile or so. As they ran, they could hear Isabel screaming at the bear. The joggers probably covered the distance in about a minute. Locating someone to help and relaying the information surrounding Isabel's situation may have taken another minute or so, and responding to the location took at least a few more minutes. This established a very short timeline of at least three to five minutes, in which the bear somehow climbed the tree Isabel was sheltering in, it had somehow pulled her out of the tree she was in to the ground below. In that short amount of time, this undersized young brown bear had mauled Isabel Dube to death before rescuers arrived. One of Isabel's jogging partners guided an armed fish and wildlife officer back to the attack scene. The officer shot and killed the young brown bear with a single bullet as it defended Isabel's body, clearly claiming it as a food source. A post-mortem analysis on the bear revealed is to be a four-year-old male weighing in at just under 200 pounds. This is very small for a four-year-old male brown bear. Isabel was the first human fatality from bear attack in the province of Alberta since 1998. Isabel's husband Heath McCroy and her five-year-old daughter Leah now had to put their lives back together after burying their beloved wife and mother. If this story ended there, it would be tragic and sad enough, but there is a second part to this story. When her mother died in this bear attack, Leah was five years old and already remarkable like her mother. She embraced the same lifestyle centered around fitness and enjoyed running on the Canmore trails. Her father and her established guidelines for trail running. These guidelines included always carrying bear spray and never running alone. Near Canmore, there had been another bear controversy brewing. Bear number 148 had a tag in her ear, meaning at some point she had been tranquilized, tattooed on her lip, and tracked after being captured near Canmore. This is typically done when the bear is involved in a human-centered problem, which could be as minor as getting into a trash bin at night, or as serious as behaving aggressively toward people on trail systems. Now, most grizzly females don't give birth until they are about five to six years old, and then only have cubs on an average cycle of every four years. Bear number 148 was six and a half years old and had no cubs. Given their lifespan averages about 25 years, this means she will only have about four litters of up to four cubs in her lifetime. Half of these cubs will die before their first year, so you can see just how precarious their long-term population can be. Leah had decided to go for a jog on the trail systems near Canmore, and this time she made a deviation to the guidelines her and her father had established and practiced for years. She was planning on going jogging by herself today and forgot her bear spray in her car, parked at the lot of the trailhead. As Leah, now 17 years old, jogged down the trail, her mind slipped into that mode that runners use to unfocus their attention. 
She bounced along the trail for several hundred yards before there was a very frightening crashing sound just off the trail. She rounded a portion of the trail and stood within just a few yards of a very angry bear, number 148. The bear was huffing and popping her jaws at Leah. There was nearly no room between Leah and the angry sow. Right then, rapid thoughts flashed through Leah's mind. She was terrified and immediately thought she would suffer the same fate as her mother. Her and her father had discussed how to be bear aware, how to back slowly away from a confrontation to bring bear spray and to not look like prey to a predator. Leah's mind went blank when she was face to face with the bear. Not only did she not bring her bear spray, she broke the primary rule when confronted by a bear. She ran away. She states that she recalls thinking how she was not dying today as she bolted from the bear. As she sailed along the trail back toward her parked car and the safety it offered, her mind flashed with fears and thoughts. She considered that this is how her mother felt in her last moments. The fear and terror had to be the same. The contrast in the mother's response and Leah's was glaring to her. Her mother stood her ground and did everything right but still lost her life. Leah did everything wrong and fled a predator that could easily catch her but managed to survive without a scratch. After safely returning to her car, Leah reported the incident to fish and wildlife officers. Bear number 148 was relocated to Jasper National Park just a few hours north following this incident. She had a tracking collar placed on her so that researchers could monitor her, and she is staying put in her new area. She seems to be fitting in well, very near where she was released. Leah explains that she wants bears to be protected and not be threatened by people. She admits there are territorial bears, and she hopes Bear 148 does well in her new home. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. Do you think it is eerie that Isabel and Leah both had close-range confrontations with brown bears on the same trail system doing the same thing? Do you think that if Isabel and her jogging partners had run away, that they would have all survived? Do you think that bear spray may have saved Isabel's life? Are local governments better off hazing bears away from municipalities to prevent conflicts between bears and humans? I look forward to reading your responses, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it.